of the Torah. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech halalem asher keshenu b'mitzvatav v'etzibenu lo asak ben dere. Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. You may be seated. The classes can be dismissed, and you may come to the tables if you so desire to take some notes <coughs> on this very powerful um, Second Peter Bible study. We are in <coughs> week 13, moving right along. We will be doing three verses tonight. Woo. Can't stop us. You can't stop us. You can try, but you cannot stop us. But we do know it only has three chapters, so we're coming, we're coming to the end. We'll have a couple more weeks, I believe. Uh, to title this, it would be The Coming Judgment. Uh, we've been talking about false teachers, false prophets, and uh, we talked a little bit last week, but we'll review here in a minute, about what, their, what the falsehood is about their teaching, and they're bringing people to a place of rejection of the Messiah. And then uh, Peter is uh, letting us know about this coming judgment. So let's, let's look at that verse and read it, and then we'll, we'll just jump right on in. It says, but uh, wanting so much to be right about this, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were heavens and there was land which arose out of water and existed between the waters. And that by means of these things, the world of that time was flooded with water and destroyed. It is by that same word that the present heavens and earth, having been preserved, are being kept for fire unto the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed so we have peter and peter is reminding us that those that mock Yehovah, because we talked about the <coughs> false t teachers the false prophets uh those that are mocking Yehovah are forgetting a lot that is true and that they are not preparing for the future only living in the present and even though the scripture does say that we don't pay attention to the past right the past is the past and that we can't really worry about the future correct which means we can't change what it's going to happen but we still need to pay attention that what we do in the present also has an effect on the future. Depending on the path that I take today is going to alter to my tomorrow. Correct? So the future is important in that we <coughs> understand the power of it, that we live according to what God wants us to do now so that our future is, uh, you know, uh, prosperous or, or blessed. So let's review real quick. It says that Peter... Uh, we talked about that Peter exhorts his readers to pay close attention to the scriptures. And we came to the conclusion that those known to have been given by the holy prophets, the Torah, the Tanakh, and the words spoken by Yeshua um, and passed on by his apostles constitutes the scripture. Uh, we, we found that in that uh, scripture, the apostles' um, words were elevated to a place <coughs> of... Um, same this, if you want to say it that way, with the Torah, because actually what they're speaking is what Yeshua spoke, and what Yeshua is speaking is the Torah. All right? So we kind of have this um, bringing this uh, New Testament, uh, the, the Gospels and the Epistles, into a place where they are in agreement with the Tanakh. But here's the thing about that. If we need to, and he's exhorting us to really pay attention to the Scriptures, then again, and I said it again, and I'm going to say it over and over and over again, it needs to be drilled in your head. You need to know that that scripture needs to be your absolute truth. Especially in the day where truth is a, f a lie. <coughs> what they think is truth. So my question would be is, do you submit to the authority of the scriptures? And that can only be understood by your halakha. How are you walking this out? The halakha <coughs> is the way that you walk. Are you walking in a way that shows people that the authority of the scriptures are in your life. How do you walk out your life? If it says to lay down uh, offense, do you lay it down? If it says not to have unforgiveness, do you have un uh, uh, unforgiveness in your life? Are you, knowing that you have the authority of the scriptures that you're living by and you believe it to be true, does it match your life? Because faith without works 
is dead. So we can say all day long, I believe the scriptures, I follow the scriptures, I know the scriptures are absolute truth. But if our lives do not match it, then in reality, we are not we're not really believing it. Correct. So Peter here intends to awaken us to the importance of knowing the truth by relying upon the written revelation that Yehovah has already given to us, which means we have to know the scripture. Study to show yourself approved, meditate on it day and night. Romans says in uh, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23, for in it is revealed how God makes people righteous in his sight. And what? In the word, right? <clears throat> and from beginning to end, it is through trust, as the Tanakh puts it. But the person who is righteous will live his life by trust. What is revealed is God's anger from heaven against all the godliness <clears throat> and wickedness of people who in their wickedness keep suppressing the truth. Why is God angry? People are suppressing the truth, which causes them to live wickedly, right? What do we say? If we know that he's going to come, uh, that scripture that we used last week, then we try to purify ourselves because we truly believe he could come today, right? <clears throat> because what is known about God is plain to them, since God has made it plain to them. For ever since the creation of the universe has invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen because they can be understood from what he has made. Therefore, they have no excuse. Because although they know who God is, they do not glorify him as God or thank him. On the contrary, they have become futile in their thinking and their undeserving or undiscerning hearts have become darkened. Claiming to be wise, they have become fools. In fact, they have exchanged the glory of the immortal <coughs> God for mere images like a mortal human being or like birds or animals or reptiles. So what he's saying basically is this, is that even nature itself is teaching us that he is who he is. We see it and yet they are unwise. They claim to be wise, but they were actually fools. OK, on the way to Harrisonburg, I was I was listening to um, a, a station and he was saying that the um, there's a new, um, you know, work out there that basically says uh, and we've all heard it before that our gender is no longer determined by by our anatomy. Our gender is determined by what is between here <coughs> in our brains, okay? And that's the study. So now they've come up with the conclusion. Now, you know, again, that's claiming to be wise, but very foolish, correct? But here's the thing. What's the world going to do with that? So that's why we have altered and changed things to accommodate those who are still in a... Uh, uh, a moment where they don't know, they haven't heard between their ears what they are yet. Uh, the very anatomy, the very creation, the very understanding that when you look at how this world operates, how your own body operates, there has to be a, a designer. There has to be a creator. You did not just roll out of the sea as a blob and then <coughs> all of a sudden all this, you know, the way everything works in your body um, is by chance. So what he's saying is there's really no excuse. OK, so Peter speaks of those who are mocking that truth, who deny that what Yehovah has revealed is true. This is true. Look what he's done. Look who he is. Look at your own body. Look what's going on. He is true by even if you never had this word, by mere understanding of how creation works and the power of that creation. So what they do, though, however, is scoff at the idea that there will actually be a final judgment, because, again, he's talking about the final judgment. <clears throat> again, final judgment. If you do away with that, then you do away with his return. If you do away with his return, you do away with his resurrection. If you do away with his resurrection, you do away with his death. If you do away with his death, you do away with his birth. You do away with his birth. You do away with the word. Right. So they scoff at this idea that there will actually be a final judgment. And we have that in the church today. The church is, again, saying, oh, now there's no hell. You know, we have uh, very well-known preachers who have decided there is no hell. And if there's no hell, that means there's no judgment. And if there's no hell, there's no judgment, then, you know, have at it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, if, if the only thing you're going to do is at the end of the day, if you don't know Yeshua, is to die and never exist anymore. <coughs> okay. Because I don't know what to live for Yeshua is. So if I don't know what that means, then just to be gone and not to have any conscious of anything and just to be kind of e evaporated. But then that's why people are just living the way they want to live, because there's no consequences to that living. So they argue that everything in the world just continues as it always has and that 
everyone's been saying that Yeshua is coming, and we've seen that he has not yet come, and so therefore it's probably not true. Right? So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. So let's look at this as we begin to take these three verses. They're very simple three verses, but they're important to us. It says, but wanting so much to be right about this, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were heavens and there was land which arose out of the water and existed between the waters. <clears throat> Let me say this. The enemy wants to take away everything where the truth is founded. If he can take away the truth, then what happens is, for instance, we know, you know, in a long, long, long time ago, they believed the earth was flat and then they had some sense to themselves and they realized that the earth was round. And even uh, the prophets knew it was round because even in Job chapter 37, verse 12, you want to write it down and read it later, talks about it being round and talks about it, you know, uh, evolving. So we know that even the prophets long ago believed that the earth was round. <coughs> Someone believed it was flat. It had to be proven or disproven. Well, whether you know it or not, in some messianic circles, guess what? Someone came up with the idea that the earth is flat. There are people like you and I in this age of 2018 who are called <coughs> flat earthers, who believe the earth is flat. And that all those things you see through the telescope is a conspiracy. They're not really there. It's not really round. You know what I'm saying? They, they were up there and they're looking down. And you say, oh, look, the earth is round. No, it's flat. And so... And, and we even have one that said, <coughs> you know, that comes and, you know, once it had said, well, let me let me come and teach uh, people about how the earth was flat. We were like, no, thanks, because uh, we, we pretty well know that the earth is not flat. All right. But they're as sincere as sincere can be. But here's the thing. The enemy, if he can take the truth away. Right. Then <coughs> and, and again, where's the false teachers? Where are the false prophets? Are they outside or the inside? They're inside the Kahili and the community. So uh, Peter is confronting those who are going to mock Yehovah by showing their willful rejection of Yehovah's revelation. And it is willful because I want you to look at that first clause of that verse. That first clause says, but wanting so much to be right about this, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word. Nothing else but God's word. Right. He spoke it. It existed. Correct. Uh, the same thing today. <coughs> so if you look at that first clause, go to the next uh, slide. That first clause, uh, go to the next one. Uh, if you look at that first clause, literally in Greek, it says, for this they willingly overlook. So you would read it this way. They want to be right so bad that they willingly overlook. So they willingly overlook your gender by anatomy. And say it has to be between your ears that you have to come to a, a thought pattern of who you're going to be, male or female. They literally want to be so right. They <coughs> willingly overlook. They willingly overlook that the, the, the sun rises and sets, that there's seasons, that that the, the this, you know, this um, universe and and uh, how everything orbits around and how we are stationary and not flying off left and right. They they are willingly rejecting <coughs> the truth. The question would be then, why? Why do they willingly reject the truth? Because here's, here it is. They know their position is contrary to the fact, but they persist and maintain it anyway because to seek to dismiss uh, Yehovah as creator, uh, creator <coughs> because they know if they acknowledge him as creator, then they have to what? Submit to him. If there's something greater, they have to submit. So let's not have a creator and we just kind of evolve on our own. Therefore, I don't have to submit to something that is greater. Right. So we have this thinking that, OK, there's no authority in my life. There's no <coughs> there's no um, uh, power or no God in my life. Therefore, I can live the way I'm going to live. Everything will be the same as it was. Because if there's no one that is in charge, then I don't have to submit to anyone. But when someone's in charge, you have to submit. Anyone who has a job, you, you are hired by someone, and you know that when you're hired by someone, they are in charge. So you automatically recognize when you go to that work and someone has hired you and they are the boss, you know that when you go there, you have to what? You have to submit. If they tell you to wear a certain thing, you have to wear it. If they tell you to go over there and clean that, you have to go do it. If they tell you to go stand on your head, 
depending on how good the money is, you'll go stand on your head. Right? <coughs> I said, depending on how good the money is. You know you have to submit or there's going to be consequences. So if we do away with creation, which means we've, we've done away with the judgment, we've done away with the, uh, the coming, and we, we go back and do it, then there's no one to submit to. So the world, and, and it's not wanting to submit to someone greater, the only thing they have to do is do away with it. And the reason why creation is very important, it's important to our uh, aspect of our faith, is because <coughs> Acts 17 says it quite well. He says, for in him we live and move and exist. And indeed, as some of the poets among you have said, we are actually his children. And the, the power of the creation is that if he is the creator, that means he owns everything. And if he owns everything, he has to be in charge. And if he's in charge, we have to submit. So therefore, what do we do? How do we get out of submit? How do we get out of the of the position of submission? Get rid of get rid of the creator, right? Get rid of the boss. Get rid of the one who owns everything, right? <coughs> he gives us breath. In him we live and move and have our breathing. You are sitting here and breathing because he's allowing you to breathe, right? Now, he put in motion the operation of your body, right? Your lungs work with your heart and all that. That's a function that he created within you. But at any time, because he created it, if he withdrew that creation... Remember, he said, let there be light, and he never, re he never retracted it. So as long as he said, let there be light, there is light. If he with, with <coughs> retracts that word, no more light, what happens to the light? It goes away because he's the one who upholds everything. He brings the sun up, and he takes the sun down. And by his word, all things are held together. We know that according to Hebrews and Colossians. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter uh, 1, 1 through 4. In days gone by, God spoke in many and varied ways to the fathers, to the prophets. But now in the last days, he has spoken to us through his son, to whom he has given ownership. What is he given? Ownership of everything. And through him, he created the universe. This son is the radiance of the Shekinah, the very expression of God's essence, upholding all that exists. How? By his powerful word. He what? Upholds all that exists. <clears throat> we are breathing because he breathed in us, right? We are living because he has caused us to live. And after he had, through himself, made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So he has become much better than angels, and the name God has given him is superior to theirs. Colossians 1.17 says, He existed before all things. And he holds everything together. How many ever said, I can't take it anymore. I'm just about ready to explode. Well, guess what? You will not explode until he tells you you can explode. <coughs> because that's what he's doing to you. He's holding everything together. All right? Which is good because when you feel like, oh, I can't take any more. Oh, this is not going to. Guess what? If he holds everything together then let him hold everything together and you can kind of take a deep breath and calm yourself because he's holding everything together. And that means he owns everything. And if he owns everything, he's in charge of everything. So he's in charge of your spouse. He's in charge of your children. He's in charge of your situation. He's in charge of your job. He's in charge of your life. He's in charge of your money. He's in charge. He's in charge. He's in charge. He's in charge. And he's holding all things together. That's where faith and trust comes in. Right. Which is why we can what? Submit to him. Because we know he holds everything together, even though we find sometimes to be wacky. <coughs> so here's Peter, who establishes several very important facts. That when the Torah opens with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you know, Genesis chapter 1, 1, correct? This is affirming that Jehovah created all the universe from nothing. Now, I know he created it from within himself. He saw it as imagination. He spoke it. But we also know that the earth was void and without form, right? Now, how long it took and when did he do it? When did he create the universe? When did he create angels? I don't know. And do I care? No. Here's the thing that I know. He did it. 
okay? We get so caught up in, I want to know exactly when. Why? <laughs> Why? Why do you want to know when? What is that going to do? How's that going to change you? <coughs> it's not. You're going to have to have the faith that it exists, right? And so the heavens came into existence by the word of Jehovah. That is, he spoken and it was so. And whether he created the expanse of the space before he created the earth makes no difference. It came into existence by his omnipotent power. And we have read that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 22, which is up there now, I believe, that says, did I make these plans lightly or do I make the plans the way a worldly man does? Re ready to say yes, yes, and no, no in the same breath. As surely as God is trustworthy, we don't say yes when we mean no. For the Son of God, the Messiah Yeshua, who has proclaimed among you through us, that is through me and Silas and Timothy, was not a yes and a no man. <coughs> How many are glad he's not a yes and a no man? How many has ever said yes and then changed your mind and said no? Right? Contrary. On the contrary, with him it is always what? Yes. Remember that sermon? Does he want us to be healed? Yes. Does he want us to walk in holiness? Yes. It is yes and what? Amen. Does he want our needs to be met? Yes and amen. It's always yes with him. Right? Correct? <coughs> they all find their yes in connection with him. That is why it is through him that we say the amen when we give glory to God. Moreover, it is God who sets both us and you in firm union with the Messiah. He has anointed us, put a seal on us, and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee for the future. So if he says that he will make sure you will not be lost, is it a yes or a no, or is it a yes? It's a yes and an amen, right? So as crazy, as cray crazy as you can get, and as, as off the path as you can go, and as, as much time as you stumble, <coughs> if you're truly his, it has been yes, and it will be amen. Could be a bumpy ride for you. <laughs> right? But it's still what? Yes and amen. So I'm in the middle of a, a horrific thing. I feel like I'm not going to make it, but he tells me I'm going to make it. So it's is it yes or no? No, it's just yes. When he says, um, you know, the greater he that is in me than he that is in the world, is that a yes or a no? That's a yes, right? When he says I can do all things, is that a yes or a no? No, that's a, that's a yes. And then we can say what with the yes? Well, amen, right? So be it. So did he create? Yes. Peter states that the earth, by the word of Yehovah, was formed out of water and by water. So let's just look really quick at these Genesis ones <coughs> because we kind of know the creation. And all Peter is doing is referring to creation, which he's saying is, it's been said from the very beginning. So if it's been said from the very beginning, this is what he's done, then this is what he's done. So I don't care what false teacher comes into your house. I don't care who's telling you the earth is flat. <laughs> if I create it around, it's round. I don't care what <coughs> they give to you. You know, you can say, but they, they give really good, um, you know, uh, subject matter, and they, and they really bring uh, stuff to the table. Well, so did Darwin. I mean, if you, if you pay attention, so, so does the world. The world, if you, if you paid attention to them, can sound pretty convincing. But their wisdom is foolishness, Right? So Genesis 1, 6 and 7, God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the water and let it divide the water from the water. And God made the dome and divided the water under the dome from the water above the dome. And that is how it was. Say that real fast. <laughs> Memorize that one. How do you know? Because God made the dome and the dome was in the water and the water was above. And, the bottom, and so it was. Genesis 1, 9 and 10 says, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear that is how it was. God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the water. He called seas and God saw that it was good. So therefore it was good. What is Peter doing in verse five? He's pointing to the creation, right? <coughs> and he's saying that if God created and we can see it in this creation and we can see it in every movement that we make and we can see it, he said it. Then if he said, now we're going to jump, and if he said there's going to be a coming judgment, then guess what? It will be because his yes is yes. He's not yes and no, right? If he said he's coming, it's going to be what? Yes. <coughs> but I haven't seen it. He didn't say yes and get advice from you on what time. He said yes. And then you just have to ride it out. And if you ride it out and you happen to die, well, then guess what? You're still going to see him, right? 
You're going to see him. You didn't get to fly up to meet him, but you're going you're gonna to still see him. Correct? So just because you are not living in the day, not saying that you will, won't, but if you're not living in the day when he returns, doesn't mean he's not returning. Right? So then let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, 6. And that by means of these things, the world of that time was flooded with water and destroyed. <clears throat> that by means of is another way of saying through which. And so what was the means or through which? How was the world created and how was the world flooded? By the word and by water. Right? If you go back to Genesis, how was the earth created? Out of the water, through water and by him speaking. How was the flood come? <clears throat> by the word of God and him speaking. So when he spoke to the water to come, the water not, you know, we talk about it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. You do realize if you read the scripture, uh, it takes more than 40 days. I know it doesn't look like it, but it takes more than 40 days of rain to destroy all the earth. The whole earth gave up all the water. So every cistern, every river, every Every spring, everything, every piece of water that was underneath the earth, the earth cracked and the water comes up. So it's not only coming down, it's also coming up, which is why it was so quick to cover the earth. Right. By the word of Yehoah, the world at that time was destroyed, <coughs> being flooded with water. So Peter is introducing this event. And when I why he's doing that. Is because he brings it into the context of that powerful judgment of Yehovah against all unrighteousness because he said he created the earth and then he also destroyed the earth, which means he can also again destroy the earth. And why did he destroy the earth that first time? Because of ungodly, unrighteous people. And what is going to happen at the end in judgment of fire? Because of unrighteous, ungodly people. So the scripture that is inspired reaffirms what the Tanakh teaches, that the flood was global and it affected this round earth. When he speaks of the world, uses that word uh, cosmos, he is describing the inhabitants in the earth's ordered form. All of it. Because I told you before that some people believe the, the flood was just local. Like wherever he was, he destroyed those people. But it was <coughs> across the world, okay, and our earth. Every culture, right. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 3, 7. It is by that same word. What word? His word, his created word, right? The same word that created, the same word that brought the flood and destroyed. It is by that same word that the present heavens and earth having been preserved. So what is keeping the heavens and the earth preserved? His word. But this heaven, this earth, according to Revelation, is going to be a what? A new heaven, a new earth. <coughs> so he's preserving right now this heaven and this earth. And they're being kept for fire, which means he has not destroyed them because he's going to destroy them by fire. That fire that is going to come until the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. So, again, note the power of Jehovah's word. Right. He spoke the universe into existence. He spoke the earth and it was formed and <coughs> he gave it order. He spoke and the flood destroyed the earth with only eight people surviving. And by his word, the present heaven and earth will be destroyed by fire as Jehovah has ordained. But right now it's being held, preserved by the very word that has been spoken out of the mouth of Yeshua. Right. If he decided this earth would explode. OK, <coughs> but it's being preserved for fire. What is fire use? What does fire represent? A purification. Right. Same thing, the water that he was purifying, he was baptizing the earth. <coughs> he was making it anew. And so he's going to make it anew again with fire. OK, so it could mean that he destroys the heaven and the earth and creates a new one. Or it could mean that the fire that's coming just kind of changes it like we are changed. Right. When we go into the water, we come out, we're supposed to be what old things pass away. Behold, all things become New. So the fire of that judgment could could be a cleansing that is happening. And when that cleansing is over, <coughs> the earth is different, like we're supposed to be different. 
So again, the whole topic of 5, 6, and 7 is about the day of judgment. And again, if we do not believe there's a day of judgment, then we're going to be in trouble because then we don't believe he's returning. If you don't believe he's returning, then you're doing away with everything. But even as Peter taught us in the previous verses that the return of Yeshua is certain, guess what? He's reminding us that it is certain that there will be a day of judgment. So when you hear people talking about there is no day of judgment, and when you hear people talk about if you're unsaved and you don't know <coughs> Yeshua, when you die, you just go away, um, I'm going to give you scripture that tells you that's not true. That's a lie of the enemy. To keep people from understanding the truth, to keep them from coming to know him. Because if there's no punishment, right, then we all know as children, if your mom and dad never punished you, then there's no boundary. You just do what you need to do and what, what, what you want to do, right? <coughs> the whole reason why you are, are you know, kind of on a leash as a child is because you know there's a punishment that's coming. And the reason why children are such running amok is because uh, we live in a society that doesn't think that anyone should be punished. Oh, don't speak too harshly. That you'll ruin them. Oh, don't touch them. Don't spank them because that's not. Well, what do you want to do with them then? Just look at them? Because you know sometimes you say, oh, honey, don't do that. That don't work. <laughs> right? Well, how do you know it don't work? Because it don't work with you as an adult. I wish I could say, oh, honey, shh, be quiet, don't sp That don't work. You're still yelling. No, I thought that's what worked. Shh, honey, shh, 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 shh. What does that usually do when you say shh, shh? That makes them matter, right? So the judgment by fire is not only upon the physical heavens and earth, but it's upon ungodly people. What kind of people? <coughs> ungodly people. All right. So let's look at ungodly people. Don't look around. Let's look up here for ungodly people. <laughs> well, who's ungodly? Do we need to look at ungodly people in the Greek? It's also used in Second Peter chapter two, five and six, which I <coughs> have here for you at your convenience. He said, and he did not spare the ancient world. On the contrary, he preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others and brought the flood upon a world of what? Ungodly people. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, reducing them to ashes and ruin as a warning to those in the future who would live ungodly lives. OK, now, when we read that ungodly people, <coughs> let me just give you a clarification of what ungodly people are. Ungodly people are those who are unbelievers. They are people who rebel against Jehovah. They are people who refuse to accept the way of salvation through faith in the Son, Yeshua. They are people who do not seek to please Jehovah, but in reality are going to live uh, their own pleasures and fulfill their own desires and their own lust. That is what ungodly people are. <coughs> that is who they are. Okay? So when he's talking about ungodly people, unbelievers, those who rebel, those who refuse, those who do not seek to please him, those who want to live your own pleasures and fulfill your own lust and also your own desires. But what does we're talking about coming judgment. And so Peter's talking about ungodly people being destroyed. All right. <coughs> so, again, if someone takes that scripture and says, OK, they're destroyed in our own English understanding to be destroyed means to be destroyed. Right. But again, you just can't take one little verse and one little word. You have to do what? Study to show yourself approved. You have to go back and see the whole context of what he's talking about. Correct. Understanding what that is, because in reality, we know that uh, in the life of Yeshua, the rich man was in, <coughs> you know, uh, hell. And then there was a gulf in between. Right. And then there was Abraham's bosom. So we know that those who were destroyed are certainly not destroyed. They were destroyed on what we visibly can see as destroyed, but something continued to live on. So when Peter's talking about destruction of ungodly people, in some contexts, we have to look at that Greek word. <coughs> that Greek word means to be utterly destroyed. It also can mean to come to ruin. 
It also can mean to have something that is wasted. Okay? It also can mean <coughs> that something that was valuable becomes unusable. For instance, salt was valuable, right? But if the salt has lost its savor, then it's, be, it's what? Unusable. Is it still salt? Yes, right? But it's not worth anything, so it's thrown into the dung hill. But it's still salt, okay? So uh, when if you got that, I'll give you a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, because not minutes, unless you're writing very slow. I'll give you a couple of seconds, because I want to go to a couple of verses. You all have it? Was that a little cry of no, no, <coughs> no. All right, you got it? All right, let's look at Mark chapter 14, 4. This is the same verse. I mean, this is the same word, okay? Uh, while they were in Bethany in the home of uh, Shimon, a man who had uh, uh, zarat or leprosy, as he was eating, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfume, pure oil of nard, very, very costly. She broke the jar, poured the perfume over Yeshua's head, and then some were angry and said to themselves, why this what? <coughs> Waste of perfume. Why was this perfume destroyed? Why are they saying it was destroyed? Because, first of all, it was costly. There was a, a reason why they used it. They used it for burial. They used it for anointing. And here we find that this woman takes this very costly ointment and does what? Breaks it over the head of Yeshua. And to them, that was a a waste. The perfume was still perfume, however, wasn't it? But it was wasted in their eyesight. So it was destroyed, yet still visible, <coughs> but destroyed because they thought it should be used for a different purpose. Acts 8.20 says, But Cephas said to him, Your silver go to ruin, and you with it, for thinking the free gift of God can be bought. Is the silver still silver? Yes, but he's saying your silver be ruined or be destroyed. What he was saying is it won't have its full value. It won't have its full value. Okay? So we find that word destroy doesn't mean that it's utterly you can't see it anymore. It just means that it's either wasted or it's ruined. Correct? Look at 1 Timothy 6, 9. <coughs> Furthermore, those whose goal is is to be rich, fall into temptation. Is being rich make you fall into temptation or the what? Your goal of, of wanting to be rich makes you fall into temptation because if you want to be rich, it makes you want to do things and do to gain that riches. Uh, they get trapped in many foolish and hurtful ambitions which plunge them into ruin and destruction or brings them to a place of being destroyed. <coughs> Does it mean that once you become rich, and your goal was to be rich, and once you get rich, all of a sudden you're poof as a... No, it means you still live, correct? However, you have plundered your life away in riches. And what good is it to have gained the whole world and to have lost your soul? Better to have what? An eye removed, an arm taken away, <coughs> than to... Enter the kingdom, better to enter the kingdom of God with a lack of limbs than to enter into hell with everything, right? So that ungodly being destroyed uh, when it comes to the coming judgment does not mean total destruction. So my question is, and we're going to answer it according to Daniel, is eternal punishment biblical? Now remember, why is Peter talking about it? Because there were false teachers that had come on in and said, uh, Yeshua is not coming. He's not coming back again. There is no final judgment. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? And that makes people live their life the way they want to live it. If we remove, that's that sloppy agape and, and greasy grace. If we remove the standard and the law from our lives, we live any way we want to live. Because guess what? We're in. We're in. We're either in or we're asleep and never to wake up. So what's the matter? So is eternal punishment uh, biblical? Yes. And let's look at it here in Daniel. When that time comes, Michael, the great prince who champions your people, <coughs> will stand up and there will be a time of distress unparalleled between the time they became a nation and that moment. At that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone whose name is found written in the book. 
Who will be delivered? Those whose name is found written in the book. And many of those sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and abhor abhorrence. But those who can discern will shine like the brightness of heaven's dome and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So if you just did like a, a little chart in your brain, <coughs> and we would say that how many righteous and how many wicked are there? According to Daniel, there are what? Many righteous and many wicked. Right? If we look at Daniel and we said, <coughs> what was their state? Well, the righteous were asleep and the wicked were asleep. So there's many righteous, many wicked. Wicked were asleep, the righteous are asleep. What is their experience? Well, <coughs> the righteous awoke or was awakened and the wicked were what? Awakened. But now here comes the difference. What is their destiny? For the righteous, everlasting life. For the wicked, everlasting contempt, disgrace. A moment, everlasting. Okay? Everlasting. Yeshua says it this way. Uh, they will go off to eternal punishment, but those who have done what God wants will go to eternal life. <coughs> so those who do what God wants... Eternal life, those who don't, eternal what? Punishment. They're both what? Eternal. Okay? They're both eternal. He doesn't say the one who follows me has eternal life, and the one who didn't, psh, just gone. Evaporated, never to exist anymore. No, there's eternity to it. Okay? And we know where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and, and great pain and agony. <coughs> and John, uh, in the book of Revelation, he says, How blessed are those who wash their robes. Uh, so that they have the right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. Outside are homosexuals, those involved with the occult and with drugs, the sexually immoral, murderers, idol worshipers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. <coughs> one is inside, one is what? Outside. One was inside Abraham's bosom, the other ones were what? Outside Abraham's bosom. And in between was a great gulf. Are they both alive? Yes. So when the enemy comes in, what's the goal of the enemy? Well, first of all, to dethrone God and to get people not to follow him. So he has to spin a lie. And what's the lie? There's no judgment. Don't worry about it. He's not coming back. Everything's going to be the same. It's always been the same. Your great-grandmother said it. It's all been the same. And it causes people <coughs> to live a life, to not purify, because we read last week, to believe that he's coming and he could come, to, and could come today, we purify ourselves. To believe that there is a judgment, you live your life a little differently. Right? If you believe that you're going to get in trouble for something that you've done, you think twice before you do it. If you don't think you're going to get in trouble, you do it without any uh, worry. Correct? And then if you get in trouble, you're shocked. Correct? We, we're missing that. Do you remember when you were growing up, to sin, you, to do something wrong, you, I mean, you were nervous about it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you were like, <coughs> but we're living in such a society today, it doesn't matter anymore. Right? So let's review and, and do an application here. Um, see, Gail, I didn't want to say it was going to be a short night because I didn't want to get you all nervous, but... <coughs> Uh, let's review and, uh, and apply. The true revelation of Yehovah has been given to all people in that creation itself reveals the invisible attributes of Yehovah. It's revealing who he is. And here's how simple it is. For God to love the world, he gave his only begotten son. What do you got to do? You just got to receive him and follow him. And, and then you got your eternal life. Right? It's that simple. He doesn't make it hard. Correct? <coughs> but he does put a demand on you. Right? Therefore, those who deny the existence of Yehovah or deny that all things were created by him willfully ignore the facts that are evident before them. They so want to be right, they ignore the facts. Now, well, I won't say that. That'll open up a whole can of words. We might be here till 930. 
Even as the father, <laughs> look how Ashley turned that right, right, poof, go ahead. <coughs> she, she was helping me. Even as the fallen world, the heavens and the earth are destined to be destroyed and new heaven and earth created, so eternal punishment is destined for all who refuse to acknowledge Jehovah and receive that grace he gives through the work of his son, Yeshua. It's as simple as just receiving it. If you receive it, you have eternal life. If you reject it, you have eternal damnation. He's not holding anything over on you. He's just saying that's what it is. Like we as parents would say, listen, if you obey, you're not going to get in trouble. If you sneak out, you're going to get in trouble. <coughs> you're supposed to be home by 10. If you're home by 10.01, you're in trouble. If you're home by 10, you're good. Everyone's happy. The only time I get agitated is when it turns 10.01. 10.01 turns to 10.05. 10.05 turns to 10.30. <coughs> now my heightened disappointment enlarges, right? But if you're in by 10, we're good. He said, listen, if you just uh, receive me and follow me, we're what? We're good. Because <laughs> I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. But if you refuse to acknowledge who I am, and remember, to refuse to acknowledge who he is means that you deny that he owns you, that he is the creator, that you somehow have created yourself, that you somehow keep yourself together, that you somehow keep that heart beating, <coughs> and again, you can do everything that you can do that's possibly right. You can eat right and exercise. But I've seen people eat right and exercise and drop over dead while they're running. Does that mean then you should eat what you want? <laughs> no. What it means is, is that you can do all that you could do. But there's one who still holds everything together. Right? Does he want you to do the right thing and be well? Yes. However, don't trust that. Trust him. Because it's in him you what? Live and move and have your being. Right? So we understand that there is eternal life, but we also understand there's eternal damnation. Well, the sad thing about that is this. We also know that, and we read it, I think, last week or in the Torah portion, that the, the, there's a broad way, correct? <coughs> and there's a narrow way. And the narrow way is what? Hard and only few find it. And we happen to live with people that we care about. You care about your family. You care about your spouses, your children, your grandchildren. You care about your siblings. And all of us sit here probably with people in our lives that have not accepted Yeshua as their Savior. Correct? <coughs> we hope that they will. Um, but, and we say maybe they prayed a long time ago, but their lifestyle is not evident that they are walking in that. So it, it, it makes us nervous or it makes us upset, right? And, and again, that is, makes us easy to say, well, God is such a loving God, he wouldn't let that happen. But he's not letting it happen. You are making a decision, right? Gail has to make her own decision. I make my own decision. My children make her own decision. Our grandchildren will make their own decision, Correct? So you might have family or you have friends who don't know Yeshua. And to know this truth, right, <coughs> upsets us. Uh, Paul understands it. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. He says, I'm speaking the truth as one who belongs to the Messiah. I do not lie. And also bearing witness in my conscience, governed by the Ruach HaKodesh. And what does he say in verse 2? My grief is so great. He says, the pain in my heart, what? So constant <coughs> that I could wish myself actually under God's curse and separated from the Messiah if it would help my brothers, my own flesh and blood. But he knows he could curse himself. That doesn't bring anyone in. Baptism doesn't bring anyone in. Church membership doesn't bring anyone in. I can, I can walk away and curse myself. That won't bring someone in. Everyone has their own decision. So what he's saying is I'm living every day with such grief and pain in my heart that they don't know Yeshua. That's how much he lived with it, which is why he becomes a great preacher, right? Because unless they have a preacher who speaks to them, <coughs> so the Torah portion this week actually goes along with this. We have to open our mouths. We have to speak. 
there is eternal blessing in store for all who are in the Messiah, and eternal punishment awaits all who reject Jehovah uh, and his way of salvation. That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, don't believe the false teachers. Don't believe just because he's delayed. There is a coming judgment. He will return, and you have to live your life accordingly. So let's close with John. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. He came to his own homeland, yet his own people did what? They did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, to those who put their trust in his person and power, he gave the right to become children of God. Not because of bloodline, physical impulse, or human intention, but because of God. Why do you sit here? Because of God. A miracle indeed, isn't it? That he found you and still wanted you. Miracle. Not because of bloodline. Not because of impulse. Not because of intentions. Not because you look good. Not because you're going to be the best. Not because you're going to be perfect. Because <coughs> we messed that up the first hour. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If that was the criteria, come and accept me and then be perfect. And you'll, Well, we... <laughs> Some of us didn't get off the altar before. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> you were praying, oh, Lord, save me, and someone came and touched you. You're like, get off me. <laughs> so you were saved, and all of a sudden you, got, you were unsaved just because someone touched you. Why are you bothering me? You're praying, oh, Lord, get them off me. <laughs> They're too close to me. <laughs> God's like, I, well, hold on, you just got saved for one second. <laughs> so we know it's only by God, Right? And he tells the truth. So if he saved you, he will keep you. He will glorify you. He is coming, but there is a judgment. And we need to live our life accordingly. Amen? Any questions? Hallelujah. Let's stand before the Lord. Don't look at your time because you don't get used to it. <coughs> don't say if he can do it one time, he can do it again. <laughs> I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? Oh, Lord. 828. <coughs> That's enough time to go home and get some cereal. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Two.
two, three. Praise Jehovah.